What do you think? I think we're dead meat. Real dead meat. You're dead meat! Go ahead and laugh, you guys. If I ever find a little bastard of business, a dead meat. Welcome to the Dead Meat Podcast, an extension of the YouTube channel Dead Meat. I'm James. I'm Chelsea, and we're a boyfriend and girlfriend, and we like to get scared <laughs> together. Yep. All right. Yeah, uh, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I put together this show every week and people listen to it every week because many of you tell me you like the research that I that I do and I I you take do good research on I take my research seriously I don't skimp on research that's right it's really important to me we we went to university mm-hmm. we learned how to research yeah and so I thought I wanted to do another research episode and I, I wanted to pick one that wouldn't be as intensive as some of the other ones we've done lately because the next two months or so are kind of a clusterfuck for us. Oh, they're such a clusterfuck. And so I thought, let's talk about horror movies that are cursed because those are, that's fun. That's air quotes, air uncursed. quotes around cursed, it's fun, urban legend type curses. shit. And I thought that'd be a nice little fluffy topic to do for a research <laughs> episode. Oh my fucking God. This is the worst time I've ever had researching anything for this show. I'm already mad at this episode. I hate this episode. I hated doing this episode. <laughs> I just, oh my God. <laughs> oh, you've been so mad research. I have been. And let me, so if you, if you are wondering what, cursed horror movies could possibly mean. I'm so glad we went out to eat right before this and I, I just had a cocktail. Yeah. So I'm ready for this, man. Come yeah, bring this fucking exactly. out. <laughs> I was talking about it at dinner and I was pissed. Um, So cursed horror movies are kind of horror movies with urban legends surrounding them. Like mm-hmm. uh, we're going to talk about the big three. I think there's, there's a oh. big three that always come up over and over again. We're going to talk about Poltergeist, The Omen, and The Exorcist all have this kind of eerie curse that people associate with them, that working on these movies caused people to die in an untimely manner or people got injured making them or just weird things happened. It's kind of like Macbeth. Yes. Have it doing the play. You're not even supposed to say You say it. the Scottish, Scottish play, play if you're we in We did Macbeth in high school because my English teacher was a fucking madman. Yeah, that's a lot for... Oh, yeah, it was. Eric Hood, you're the man. That guy Oh, I, I hear socialist. lots of good things about about that guy. <laughs> yeah, that guy's awesome. Did you were, you... were you not allowed to say the play in the... No, he let us say what the fuck ever we wanted. It nice. was great. Because yeah, he's he not care. superstitious. I guess not. And I'm not superstitious. I've said it, I'm sure, many times on this podcast. I don't believe in anything that's not, you know, science. So curses, whatever. Yeah, we're pretty um skeptical. Yeah. Skeptics. Yeah. James Randi is our I do love James Randi. Yeah, man. And the he's fine my folks homeboy. at the Randi Institute. Although, Listen, all I'm saying is they haven't had to pay that million dollars. I was about to say, you know? I really do hope someday someone gets that million dollars. <laughs> so too. me too. Yeah. yeah. I, I genuinely hope someday someone gets the million dollars by It'd going so to the cool. Randi Institute and proving that they have supernatural powers. But I would love to be proved wrong. Oh, same. That there is magic and uh That's all I want. I really <laughs> no, really, I, I genuinely So when I'm re okay, so researching this topic Mm -hmm. i'm thinking it okay it shouldn't be too hard to put together an episode about this because all these connections are pretty tenuous at best it's not like there's any actual research i'm gonna have to do because none of it's real anyway (laughs) but little would i know that the events that people claim comprise the curses for these films have been so poorly researched that this would take over my life for a couple weeks (laughs) God damn. Let's just go through each movie. Okay. We're going to start with with Poltergeist. Because mm-hmm. that's kind of... I think Poltergeist is the one I think of when I think of cursed movies. Absolutely. As soon as you brought this topic up as a potential episode, I was like, oh, like Poltergeist. Right, Poltergeist. For sure. And I mean, that's got a big element to it in the fact oh, that that poor little girl died. Yeah. Oh, and and okay, I'm, I'm glad you, you said that because I do want to remind or, or warn people that... Mm. We're talking about some head. That's another reason this- researching this sucked. Yeah. Because a lot of this revolves around the fact that very real 
very terrible shit happen to people. Mm-hmm. And we're going to be talking about a lot of dark stuff. Plane Tough crashes stuff. and murder, murder, a, uh, child death. It's yeah. it's gonna get depressing. So so that sucks. Heads up for mm-hmm. this one. Uh, yeah, yeah. The curse that kind of surrounds Poltergeist is, I think, yeah. People associate it with the death of not one but two of the children of the family in the mm-hmm. film, and the fact that real human skeletons were used now is that true this is true that's a true confirmed thing. true because yes i that was one thing where i knew instantly i gotta fact check that because i'd always heard that too mm-hmm. and in the pool scene at the end that there are real human skeletons in there wow confirmed those are real skeletons so craigie nelson <laughs> Craigie T. Craigie Nelson, T. Nelson is uh he's swimming around with real human remains there apparently wow. uh, assistant prop master bruce casson confirmed that they were real. The skeletons were real. That they came from Carolina Biological, and they came from a medical supply company. So, uh, I think this was back before they had really good replica skeletons for medical school use. So you would just buy um, skeletons that are made from people where we don't really know. It, I think it makes it's me think sh- of like Frankenstein. It's a little bit shady. I mean, that's how medical students would get bodies back yeah. then, is they would go rob graves and stuff. Mm-hmm. This is a little bit past that era, but <laughs> <laughs> it's still a little shady. Yeah. Um. So this is a quote from the the special effects makeup artist Craig Reardon. He said, "I acquired a number of actual biological surgical skeletons. Is what they're called. They're for hanging in classrooms in study. These are actual skeletons from people." I think the bones are acquired from India. We're not, <laughs> we're not sure, I guess. But at any rate, we got 13 of these, and we dressed them so that they looked not like bleached, clean, bolted-together skeletons, but instead disintegrating cadavers. And we added sculptured rubber and things to them so they would have kind of a dramatic, leering, spooky effect and not be dull, um, clinical-type corpses. So, yeah, they're real. And I think maybe um, people take that and kind of put the idea that we're maybe creating a curse because we're using real skeletons or there yeah. there is something that I think human nature we're like we shouldn't be doing that with people's remains I don't know if I'm look if anything happens to me use me as a prop in your movies okay I give you full permission. I think that's great. Would you rather be used as a prop in a movie or uh, as a skeleton in Pirates of the Caribbean? Ooh, that's tough. Because is that real skull? Is that a real thing or is that just a myth? I, that oh, there's a real I don't know. human skull Right, because that, that could just be a myth. That's, I don't know. That could just be a myth. I don't know. That would be kind of neat, though, to be one of those. Yeah, that's tough. I'll get back to you on that. All right, yeah, just let me know. But then the other thing that that unfortunately, and this is re- you know this is real, this is stuff that happened, is two of the actors that played the children in the movie died. How untimely. young were you when you watched Poltergeist? Oh, I was pretty young. Did you know that these? No. Oh, I grew up knowing that these oh. kids died. Like I, it was just part of like I. We watched Poltergeist at an early age, the whole trilogy, and I remember just like knowing as early as watching that, that my mom was like, yeah, that little girl died. Oh, God. I know, it's weird. Yeah, actress Heather O'Rourke, she died at 12 years old oh, after starring fuck. in the first three Poltergeist movies. She died in the middle of shooting the third one. Apparently. I think there's some um, conflicting, like we don't really know, like did they wrap the movie? That, but I don't I think I think they ended up using a body double on parts of Oh, the really? Movie. I think so. I haven't really like dived deep into the Poltergeist movies. Yeah, it's depressing. But I'm pretty sure that yeah, they, that she didn't finish wrapping yeah. out. She uh she had emergency surgery to repair acute bowel obstruction, and mm. she died of septic shock because I they were uh she was misdiagnosed with Crohn's disease. So is it something that was avoidable then? It was an emergency I think, I surgery think problem. So because of this diagnosis, it then or this <sighs> misdiagnosis, it turned into. She so it wasn't needed. like she had leukemia. Right. Like, I think it, it, it like I a, think it was a preventable. Fuck, I know. Shit. I know. And then the other daughter, uh, Dana Freeling, is the older daughter. Actress Dominique Dunn. She was killed. I think. Oh, I, I forgot to put how old she was. I think she was like 20, like early 20s. Yeah. She's very young. Young. Uh, she started dating a guy named John Sweeney, who was a chef or cook i'm not quite sure okay um and he this guy was very jealous and abusive and 
she li- she left him a, a bunch of times and it's like that same tragic story you hear over and over again he apparently i think after she left him he showed up to her house this is a 1982 and i with a chocolate mask of her face and i re- i literally still have in my notes fact check this and when i went to fact check it someone said that if you look at the pictures of like her house there is you can see like a box and people think that that people think he did make a chocolate mask of her face how do you even do that i i have no idea how do you make a chocolate mask of someone if i wanted to make a chocolate mask of your face to surprise you for your birthday maybe hypothetically do while i'm sleeping or something like just <laughs> <laughs> put that baker's chocolate all over me yeah i don't really know i don't really know what that means but it's not it's creepy right oh god yeah and then i read the next sentence Fuck. yeah and they had an argument on their on uh her porch and he strangled her to death and, strangled yeah and she died four days later after being in a coma oh, and man. by the way she had called uh, cops on him a bunch of times um been reported a bunch of times she tried to break up with him a bunch of times what is this he served less than four years oh yeah that's right that's the next really cool fact about this story why he did... served less than four years for this crime why he changed his name after he got out of prison and he's still just like out there he's what around the fuck yep yeah, I told you, really fun fucking episode, James. <laughs> I love this one. Really She's been so light, mad. easy episode that was really cool and good to research. Uh, but yeah, so those those two oh. deaths are so upsetting and and so like I think it's human nature to want to have some reason, especially when they're so young. When they're so young, and it's it's such a bizarre coincidence that they're both from this family in this movie. And I think we just, we just want to have a reason that this happened. And so I think that's a big reason why we ascribe it to being a curse. Uh, can we get a, a, a timeline check here? Cause uh, that, that woman died in 1982. That's the year that the first one came out. Yeah. So it was like right after. So I believe her character must have been recast because I think her character continues on. I don't know. That's a weird thing to recast. Yeah. The oh man. Okay. All yeah. Right. I don't. Yeah. Sorry. I don't really have details about the rest of the mm-hmm. the series. Um. Because I, I don't really know the Poultry series that well. I know the first one, but not the other. How many are there? Three. There are three total. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. Apparently, also the animatronic clown in that first one yeah malfunctioned on set and almost strangled oliver robbins who is he a little, little boy a little boy which again who knows like did it really strangle him or did it just was it grabbing him kind of tight you know mm-hmm. who knows because i i think stuff like this people will exaggerate for a fact yeah and i don't think who knows if he was in any real danger it's a good story Okay. Actors Julian Beck, who he played Kane, and Will Sampson, who played Taylor. You might also know Will Sampson from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Oh, He's is he chief? chief? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, they're also mentioned sometimes alongside this curse, but they were both older and died of... Um, uh, Julian Beck died of stomach cancer, and Will Sampson died of complications of a heart and lung operation. Like, they weren't unexpected deaths. Yeah. You know, and they were older and they had ongoing health problems, so. Uh, Kane, by the way, I I haven't seen the second Poltergeist in quite some time, but Kane, the character, who is like an older, like, southern reverend guy, he is incredible. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, that performance by Julian Beck still sticks with me to this day. It's incredible. And I think he was, yeah, it looks like he was kind of recast for the third one after he died there mm-hmm. in like a smaller role. But uh, yeah, I, I want to watch that second one just for him. Did you see if they recast Dominique Dunn? Uh, I was mistaken. It's a different character named Donna who's in the third one who is actually played by Laura Flynn Boyle. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, but Donna, Dana. Yeah, no, Dana was not recast. She was... The only family member who's not there in the wow, second one. So they just didn't even. I don't know how they address it. They damn. probably say she's off to college or some shit like that. I don't God know. God damn. Yeah. Uh, Poltergeist 2 director 
Uh, Brian Gibson died in 2004 of Ewing sarcoma. So this is one. It's just that's, like that's just that's sounds life. like a death. Yeah, and we, yeah, we're gonna talk about like, that, how old is that phenomenon just... too. Yeah. Um, some versions of this curse insist that all of the child actors from the first one died. They did not. Oliver Robbins is still very much alive, or that. All of the actors from the first one are dead. They're not. Craig T. Nelson is out there making Incredibles movies because he's Mr. Incredible. That's right. And uh, Joe Beth Williams and Tom Skerritt are still out there, too. I think they'd be surprised to learn that uh, people <laughs> think that they're dead because yeah. they were in this movie. Um, and then uh, just for our last kind of <laughs> bullshit, tenuous uh, <laughs> actress Joe Beth Williams, who played the mom, claims she'd come home after filming and she would find... All of the pictures in her home were crooked. Oh wow! Scary. Wait, oh, no. What then, is this last little yeah, fact I about forgot. Lou Perryman? I'm sorry, it was on. It, it would like went onto the next page. I know Lou Perryman. You, did you know this? No. Hey, this sucks. <gasps> oh no. Yeah. Oh wait, I think I did. I read think about we talked. I think we talked about this. Yeah. Fuck. And I think maybe we just like blocked it out of our memories because it sucks. Um, actor Lou Perryman, who had a small part in the original as a construction worker, probably, and I would say actually, yeah, mostly better known for being LG in LG Texas Chainsaw in Massacre Texas 2. Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. I know. He, he had a crush on Stretch. Mm -hmm. He, she ended up. Uh, he builds his little house out of the. Uh, yeah, the fry, built the, the fry house that's for That's right, you. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he, uh, he was murdered Fuck. by Seth Christopher Tatum with an axe in 2009 when this dude just randomly showed up at his house. It's a fucking nightmare. He just been released from prison for robbery and just uh, went to a house and murdered him. I think he let him in. I, I, I think it was a thing where it was like maybe I asked if he could come in to use his phone something. I don't know. But it's just one of those like Fuck. it's one of those things that like never happens. Yeah. But it just unfort it happened to him. It's scary. Oh man. Yeah. So that's poltergeist. The poltergeist. Curse. Thanks, poltergeist. Yep. Thanks, Spielberg. <laughs> so next up is the Omen. Okay. When did you last see the Omen? Because I haven't watched it since I was a kid. It's been. Uh, it, it was more recent than that, but I think it was like maybe right after college or. That was uh, when I was allowed to watch as a kid. Okay. Because I don't think it's too I don't know, man. Gory? Those dogs eat, eat some That's people true. up. That's true. And that guy's head gets and then that lopped off. And nanny just tosses herself yeah. out the window. I don't know. No, it's I, a pretty fucking graphic movie, You know movie, what, actually. though? I think that one was was okay in my house because that one was seen at the time, and it still is. It's a bit more, if we want to use that term, everyone hates elevated horror. Oh. Because it was so, yeah. yeah that This one was very big budget, very glossy, and... It's a fancy horror movie. And it has Gregory Peck it has in Gregory it. Peck, It's yeah. real Hollywood shit, right? <laughs> so, yeah, it's speaking of Gregory Peck. God, this episode's depressing, James. Yeah, why would you do this, hon? Because it sounded like a good idea. These good people tune in, looking to have a good time, listening to the Dead Meat Podcast. A lot of people requested this, and I thought, <laughs> great, that's a great idea. But it actually is really depressing. So Gregory Peck is cast as Ambassador Thorne. <laughs> right after he's cast, his son commits suicide. Oh, but fuck. he still decides to star in the film. While flying over the Atlantic, apparently lightning struck Gregory Peck's plane. Is that true? This I Yeah, as far as I can tell, that's true. Uh, lightning struck producer Mace Newfeld's plane a few days later, too, as, uh, as well as screenwriter David Seltzer's. Jesus. But then I also looked into how often lightning strikes planes, and okay. you may be interested to find out that lightning strikes planes all the time. Apparently, each plane statistically once a year is bound to get struck by lightning at least once. Wait, each plane each or plane. a plane? At, for every 1,000 flight hours, every... Individual plane. So, like, if I'm flying a plane for a thousand hours, statistically, mm -hmm. I'm going to get struck by lightning at least once. Really? Yeah. And I'm assuming most planes fly every day. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like not, I think it's pretty rare that something bad happens because yeah. lightning strikes your plane. Like, they're built for it. I'm assuming. Yeah. Okay. I could be, I could be, I could have misinterpreted that statistic. If I did, let me know. Okay. Um, this is not my area of expertise. If anyone knows more about planes and shit than I do, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure it's, it's a common occurrence to sure. have a plane be struck. So I think, do you feel it when it happens? I have no idea. Now I kind of want it to happen to me. Mm, spooky. <laughs> <laughs> then, okay. This is when 
I started losing my mind and I, I'd been researching poltergeist that I was, I was, that was more depressing oh, than anything. I see anything. a lot of caps written down. Lots of, you're starting to see all the all caps in my notes, right? Because that's where I'm getting really fucking pissed Hold trying how, to put together this episode. How'd you get the episode? font to like slide off the edge of the paper <laughs> like that? Lord. All right. So here's the part of the fucking omen curse that okay. good. Okay. Here's researching this topic. Yeah. Is clicking through websites that do the six most cursed movies of all time and their mm-hmm. sources are other lists of the eight most cursed <laughs> movies of all and they all just link to each other and it's all this unsourced information including sites i normally respect and find pretty decent sources of information no one has any fucking sources for any of this shit it is like it really it is like a human centipede of bad sourcing. It's all these sites eating each other's poop and just shitting into each other's mouths and not sourcing anything so that I have to go and look at literal actual plain like dot gov plain records trying to find out if any of this shit is true. It took me so long to research yeah, this. You're poor over like Chinese flight manifest. Yes. No, you think that's a joke, but I was actually doing that. And this is why this this little bullshit tidbit here is why I wasted hours doing this, James. So there's a there's a thread link to this curse about a near miss plane crash, and a bunch of sites report it as it's all it's usually Gregory Peck canceling a flight to either Israel for some reason or the film crew having a, a charter plane that they rented. They bail on them for a higher bidder, like another client would said they'd pay them more to take the charter so they cancel on the film crew and take this other group of people instead. Got it. I couldn't find any sourcing that this crash ever happened. I did later, after hours, I found a flight that matched the description of what this entails. But apparently this uh, either Gregory Peck's charter plane or this film crew's charter plane, whatever plane it was, that was booked for use in the omen it uh crashed after they rented like they the charter canceled on them and then this plane goes and crashes and alternately either everyone dies or for some reason either chinese or japanese businessmen get roped into this story it it depends on what sites reporting it some people say oh chinese businessmen took this plane and they all died or that? japanese tourists took this plane and they all died. i don't i dude i don't know why is that a detail that's included i don't know and so Just this nameless then chinese after business. hours going around in what? circles trying to research this crash i find <laughs> one crash that I think matches the description. So I think this could have happened. Okay. So this is the flight. So on the on November 20th, 1975, a British aerospace BAE-125 overran the runway at Dunsfold Aerodrome after a bird strike on takeoff. The aircraft hit a car that was traveling along the A-281 at the time and stopped in a nearby field, killing six people in the car and injuring one crew member out of nine passengers and crew. The aircraft was being flown by the well-known World War II fighter fighter ace john cunningham why do japanese businessmen and chinese businessmen get looped into the story why does israel get involved with this story why is it that the whole plane like everyone on the plane dot they're so it is insane james people just making shit up and posting it online don't make shit up and post it online man <sighs> but it doesn't this, help anyone this i think is the plane that either i what i what i think it is is i think the crew tried to rent this plane to get aerial shots of the area that they're filming in in London. That's mm-hmm. what I think happened. And then it, they canceled or the plane canceled and this happened. Everything else is bullshit. I don't know why we're adding weird little racist <laughs> tidbits in here to make it seem more interesting. Well, I feel like racial, not racist. Just saying they're Japanese businessmen aren't. But just making that just like, you know, because it's fun flavor, just, you know, a little, <laughs> little spice to make it more interesting, you know? Yeah. It's ridiculous. Okay. All right. Uh, tiger. Tiger. <laughs> It just reminded me of speaking of races, the guy in Get Out. He's like, oh, I love Tiger. Wait, what are you talking 
<laughs> when they're like, when they're at the fucking, uh, he's meeting all the white people who are going to auction for his body. And yep, the one guy's yep. like, do you golf? I like Tiger. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. I think. He loves Tiger. He lo- <laughs> A Tiger <laughs> mauled animal handler Sidney Bamford to death. This is actually oh. happening. Um, There's varied reporting of this happening on set. Or was it? During filming, this was the animal handler for the movie. Yes, Gilman. yes. Probably handling um, those this dogs. this did happen in 1975. I found the newspaper article about it because, again, I don't trust anything I read online. Uh, but in the words of producer Harvey Bernhard, he was killed the day after we shot there. He was killed by a tiger. He grabbed him by the head and killed him instantly, and that's apparently true. Oof. Yeah. So that was on set of the Omen, or that's no, I. I don't know it if it was like it wasn't. on. I think it was just a this separate. was while it was while they were in production. Yeah, I think that this happened. Okay. Yeah, I don't think it was like while they were filming yeah. with them though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, the oh man, this sucks. Special effects consultant John Richardson was involved in a car crash a few months after the Omen came out. He and his assistant Liz Moore were in a head-on collision in the Netherlands that killed Liz. And she was decapitated oh, no. in a manner similar to the infamous death of the photographer in that oh, movie, wow. which do you remember that part or no? no. The photographer is like um, next to the back of this truck and this giant sheet of glass slides out and like hit chops his, and his head is like spinning around. It's a, it's a great effect, but it's, it's creepy that this happened. Oof. And then there's this weird little addition to this story. And this is bait. This is all hearsay. And it's, it's John Richardson saying that this happened, but he claims that when he crawled out of the car, he, since they were in the, the Netherlands, he saw a sign that said, I don't know if you pronounce it, Omen, O-M-M-E-N, which is, I think it's a city, and it said 66.6 kilometers away. That was the road sign he was by. Apparently, that's not a road sign that exists, but he was by a kilometer marker that does say 66.6, and he was by the town of Omen, so he could have seen both of those things on the way to the hospital. Sure. He's in shock. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. I don't, he's his little, little tidbit here is not one where I'm like, that's a bullshit guy. I'm like, no, <laughs> you just had a, a, uh, a traumatic experience. I'm not going to. Producer Mace, New, uh, I don't know if it's Neufeld or Neufeld, was staying at the Hilton in London during production when the IRA, the Ooh. Irish Republican Army, blew up the building, but him and his wife were not inside. They were unharmed. Um, A few days later, Mace Neufeld, Gregory Peck, and some other producers were on their way to a restaurant when that, too, was blown up by the IRA. And I wrote, I don't know if it's curse or just you're in London during the 1970s. Yeah. (laughs) That's not a place you want to be during the 70s. The Troubles. That's called the Troubles, and they weren't a good time. No. Yeah. So, I don't. yeah, again, I'm like, curse? No, I just think there's a lot of shit getting blown up. Yeah. (laughs) In the 70s. But yeah, uh, Harvey Bernhard apparently said, this is his quote, the devil was at work and he didn't want the picture made. Why wouldn't he though? It's a movie about him. I mean, it's him as a little kid. Oh, maybe he's embarrassed. Mm -hmm. Maybe he had like a rough period. It's like when you don't want your parents to show your friends your- uh, Your baby pictures. Yeah, your baby pictures are like- (laughs) Here. It is like his Star Wars prequels. <laughs> what? It's like Anakin. <laughs> yes, the Omen is Satan's Anakin Skywalker. The Omen is the Star Wars prequels of the Bible. Oh, okay. Guys, I'm tired. We're <laughs> filming this late at night. We don't normally like do 11:30. that. It's <laughs> We never film this late. <laughs> Oh, this is such a dumb episode. Yeah. It's so depressing. Uh, The Exorcist. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Cursed as fuck, apparently. <laughs> this, And I think, uh, the, again, the idea of this curse stems from the fact that this was based off of a real quote unquote. Ooh, so, like, just heavy <laughs> quotes. <laughs> My fingers can, yeah, even can popping. You hear, yeah. Can you hear our heavy knuckles cracking? <laughs> based off a real event. The author of the book, William Peter Blatty, heard about this exorcism that the book was based on, which happened in 1949. And he starts looking into it in the late 1960s. This Actually, I had a bunch of research done already on it because I was going to include it on our horror based on real events thing, but I opted to not include it because 
none of this shit fucking happens. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's technically a real event, but it's not. Yeah. So I'll I'll run through it now because I had that research done and it's nice. kinda it's kinda fun. Good job, Pastor. This Chelsea. might this might be a little bit of a detour, but it's kinda fun learning about the exorcist. This is a fun one? Yeah. This isn't gonna Yeah, this little segment won't be depressing. Yeah. It's just, you know, a kid being pretending he's possessed oh that's fun getting a bunch of priests to waste their time trying to exercise cool him. let's do that so one of the <laughs> one of the priests and the exorcists uh, involved in this case that did happen in 1949 said father william s bowder and says he can't discuss it because the archbishop of the church directed that it be kept secret because yeah, it was direct such a, a lot of secrets yeah but he did tell uh, the author blatty about a diary that one of the other priests, Father Raymond J. Bishop, kept at the events. And so the details from this diary, you have the boy identified as R. And if you're familiar with this case, you may know him as Roland Doe, which okay. is how I know it. So I'm going to, I'll just call him Roland for this. Uh, the boy was born in 1935 and he's raised evangelical Lutheran in January 1949. So he's a teenager at this point. Roland and his grandma start hearing scratching noises in her bedroom. And later, the family hears more noises at night when mom and grandma are laying with him in bed. I guess because he's scared. They're all like laying in bed together. And when he's like 14. <laughs> yeah, 14, it's, 14. I know. It's like, it's weird. <laughs> in presumably <laughs> a really small bed. Yeah. You know, I like really Wonka style. They're all sleeping in bed together. Yeah. <laughs> For, uh, so I, I guess objects start at this point. They're getting thrown around the house, and one case a Bible Ooh, oh, gets thrown a- across the room or something. Don't throw Bibles. Yeah, but you know who does that is the devil. Devil throws Bibles. Yeah. Oh. At this point, this kind of sounds like a, your typical poltergeist case. Speaking of poltergeist, and it's also oh, you mean typical poltergeist like the the ghost, not the movie, not the movie. Okay. Which. A poltergeist is a ghost who can fuck with shit, right? A poltergeist is a is an annoying ghost. Yeah, but specifically they can. Fuck yeah, they move with stuff around. Things. They throw yeah. things. Yeah, and... yeah, that's what makes a poltergeist. But it's interesting because it shouldn't. It's not a coincidence. I don't think that most of these poltergeist cases are <laughs> little kids because young kids and teenagers are the ones to try and pull this kind of crap. I don't think that's a coincidence at all. That all these poltergeists <laughs> just happen to be centered around these teenagers who want to just fuck around with their parents. And so all this so far, by the way, is secondhand knowledge to the priest writing this diary. He wasn't there for any of this. So they're just telling him, like, this totally happened before you showed up, right? Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So then Roland starts becoming really unruly, and there's a threat of him becoming violent. So he's starting to really scare the family. Psychologists and psychiatrists examine him. They just think he's kind of weird. <laughs> I don't have a, a, a diagnosis. I think they were just like, yeah, your kid's weird. Get him out of here. There's nothing wrong with him. He's just fucking weird. <laughs> and he's throwing stuff around. <laughs> Tell him to stop. <laughs> so then some ministers get consulted and they suggest bringing in the big guns. And that's the Catholic Church. Because the Catholic Church is all about the supernatural shit. If there's ghosts or demons, poltergeists, you got to call the Catholics. They know how to handle that. The that's for, one man. thing they're good for. <laughs> <laughs> That's one thing the Catholic Church has done right. They deal with all the fun, spooky shit. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got that going for us, James. <laughs> and so Roland is admitted to a Jesuit hospital, and Father E. Albert Hughes gets ready to perform an exorcism as Roland's con- condition worsens. Apparently, the bed is shaking, there's scratches showing up on Roland's chest, he's speaking in tongues. Again, all things that can be explained as he's doing this stuff to himself, even the scratches. Because if you, I think the the guy who I was reading an excerpt of this guy's book, um, I'll, I'll have to put a link to the to it in the description. But he was saying that he even went and tested uh, the types of scratches this kid would give himself because they would claim the priest would writing this would claim he would watch a scratch like appear before his eyes. Yeah. But you're able to, if you do it just right, you can scratch yourself and your skin isn't going to turn pink until, oh, you know, it's yeah. a delayed, it'll swell and it's a delayed reaction and you can kind of, you know, use some tricks. Yeah. And, right. So that's what's going on. Oh, that's a lot of fun. Try it at home. <laughs> no, actually don't. Please don't <laughs> mutilate yourselves. It is an experience. You got to do it real stealthily. Be like, hey, priest, what's that over there? Oh, yeah. That's some real sleight of hand. 
stuff. Look, it's mm -hmm. yeah. Look at appear before your eyes. Yeah, look at. Yeah, that's pretty wow. red. You're possessed, James. Wow. Or maybe you just had a cat. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, want to talk about our sponsor this week? Hello Fresh. Hello Fresh. Hello Fresh. <laughs> <laughs> we love Hello Fresh. We love having our meals delivered to us. It's a meal delivery service that takes all the hassle out of grocery shopping, meal planning. Meal planning is hard. Meal planning's the worst. I don't mind the cooking. Mm -hmm. That process can be fun. You put on a podcast, you make yourself a meal, you bing, bang, boom, you got food to eat. But picking what to eat. Yeah. Wow, that's a pain. It is. But with this, you don't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. You get all of your ingredients all pre-measured, put together in a box for you. It's really the easiest they could possibly make it besides them making it for you. Yeah, besides <laughs> them coming to your house and making your food like a like you're a child yeah this treats you like an adult yeah <laughs> but still makes it really simple for and you. i i don't like cooking she i doesn't. don't enjoy it but i i helped make the, the hello fresh i made and you let me tell you <laughs> it wasn't that bad yeah i was like chelsea i know that i always have to do the cooking but we're doing this hello fresh it's for the podcast podcast is yours do, yeah you gotta help and then, yeah I, I did and it was fine yeah i was able to help cook there's three different plans to choose from, too. There's classic veggie and family. We did veggie because I don't eat red meat, so mm -hmm. that was nice. And those were great, too, because I think sometimes with vegetarian meals, it can be hard mm -hmm. because you know, you can only eat so many salads. Only but so this many was salads, like, man. oh, we had a butternut squash ravioli. That was real good. That was so good. I love butternut squash. So if you want to try HelloFresh, which you do, you can get $80 off your first month. If you go to HelloFresh.com slash DeadMeat80 and enter promo code DeadMeat80. Yeah, that's like getting eight meals for free. Yeah. Thanks to us. That's so many meals for free. Right? Yeah. That's Yeah, worth, we're feeding you at this it. point. It's... Not only are we feeding your minds with great podcast material courtesy of Chelsea, we're also feeding your bodies with uh, great meals courtesy of HelloFresh. Nice. I could see your face as you were saying that. And, and how was... much, how proud I was as I said it. I was like, You're yes. a real Don Draper over there. <laughs> so once more, that's HelloFresh.com slash DeadMeat80. HelloFresh is a carousel. <laughs> I also want to give a shout out to Blowing Rock Woodworks. They gave me the most incredible desk i've been needing a new one yeah it's so beautiful if you're in the market for a desk especially a standing desk which is a big deal for me because i work from home and sitting all day is not great for you mm -hmm. this place is the best they're a locally owned store so it's not like a big box furniture store like this they will custom make you a desk so mine is custom made and it fits just so in our office so yeah. lucy's little cat tree still fits there and it's great because I got a standing desk when, uh, you know, we first made this our job and turned the, like, revitalized the home office. I got a standing desk and a treadmill uh, to walk on underneath the desk. And it was so sad for you. You just had this little table and you've had it for so long. But now with this standing desk that they so graciously gave you, I know. you can use the treadmill. Yeah, but Oh, I have a desk. It's not like a, a kitchen table. It was just I, an Ikea kitchen it was table. A kitchen it table sucked. Was, yeah, it was not great. But yeah, this is, oh, I love it. It's it, high quality stuff, seriously. It's beautiful. It is. Yeah, the that's wood. the thing is it's, I think it's it's a maple and they left the front edge of it just a little, they left a little bit of the raw texture. So the front of the desk is kind of uh, like wavy. Yeah. It's really cool. It's great. Lucy loves it. Yeah. She hangs out on your desk it's so much does. now ever since you got that. Yeah. So if you are interested and you're in the market for a new desk and you want something like high quality, this is handmade for you, like this is, you know, you're getting what you pay for. It's really, really good mm -hmm. stuff. You go to Blowing Rock Woodworks and you can use the code DEADMEATDESK to get 10% off. Yeah. Yeah. So do that for our friends over there and treat yourself. Cause... Yeah. And like support a small business too. Mm -hmm. There's like an artisan business. Yeah. Right? Which we always try to support. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Blowing Rock Woodworks, for uh, completing our home office. Yeah. Thank you. The exorcism begins and it's quickly over when Roland gets free from his restraints. He pulls a bed spring loose and he's slashed. Hughes' arm all the way from the shoulder to the wrist, and he required over 100 stitches. That's for real, I think. 
But the result, <laughs> but there, oh yeah, no, I do have my next notice, but there's doubt as to whether this entire episode even happened. Oh. Yeah, it's weird. Like, we have people claiming it happened, but I think it's like the records of it are, we don't, that's the thing with all this shit. Yeah. We don't, it's, it's people just making yeah, shit 20 up. it's years later. Yeah. So the family moves to St. Louis, and this is when Father Bishop, who is right, this is the guy writing this diary and keeping an account. This is when he gets involved. So, uh, there's, a lot, of layers it, there's a lot of priests. I know it's not that important, but okay. one of the other exorcists, Father Bowder, and believes all this could have easily been done by Roland. We even have one of the priests like this kid's just doing this. <laughs> <You> guys, <laughs> come on. However, the Archbishop tells him to perform an exorcism on Roland anyway, alongside Father Bishop and Father Walter what Halloran. What does that mean? Perform an exorcism? What does that mean? Just like fucking throw yeah, throw water holy water and, and say some yell words. At them and- yeah, it's fun. <laughs> I would I would love to go to an exorcism. Would you like what? Observe or partake in one? Both. I would I would exorcise if I could become a certified exorcist, I would be very happy. Would you let someone exercise you? If I had a demon in me, sure, but I don't know if that's happening would anytime like, soon. Would you pretend in order to get an exorcist? No, because that just seems I don't want to make fun of people. Do you know what I mean? Cause there's people who really believe in that. Oh, they like. And really I don't want to waste it. their yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Even I, if I think it's bunk, I I don't want to. That seems cruel. Sure. But I would go with those people and perform an exorcism. <laughs> Cause then I'm. I think it's more. I want to like. What do you do? I want to watch you do your thing. Even if I think it's bullshit, I still find it interesting. Yeah, Does yeah, that yeah. make sense? Of course. Yeah. So more scratches appear, and our our Roland is convulsing and punching his pillow. He starts getting so uncontrollable that now this one skeptical priest, Father Bowden, is, is now he's like, "This is the devil." He's oh. convinced this is the devil at work, so he changes his mind. Oh, good job! So Roland, Roland is thrashing, spitting, he even urinates. We I think that's something that we get in the you know it's put in the book and then the movie because that's a famous scene. We have Reagan peeing on the Yeah, the coming floor. down to her mom's party and just peeing there. Mm-hmm. So from the diary, this is a quote, Roland screamed in a diabolical high-pitched voice. He cried, he spat, he cursed his father, he mimed masturbation, also something in the film, and he bit his caretakers. His condition worsens. He's admitted to a hospital run by monks, put in a secure room with bars on the windows and a bed with straps. And these possessed fits continue at night, but after a few weeks in the hospital, Roland announces he's gone. He says he's gone. That's in quotes. And he says he had a vision of a, quote, very beautiful man wearing a white robe and holding a fiery sword, unquote. Oh, Probably heaven Jesus. Is for real. Yeah. And Jesus drove the devil into a pit. No further episodes after this. And then the whole family converted <laughs> to Catholicism. Got him. Got him. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> Score one for the church. Roland was put in the hospital and then got bored. Dude, that's <laughs> what I think happened is he got put in this room where he's strapped to a bed and there's nothing to do. And he's like, fuck, I got to get out of this somehow. <laughs> but I have to I have to plan it so that it doesn't look like I'm faking being better. I got to like long con this so I can yeah. get out of here. Because <laughs> he was like a teenager, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So he was like was old like, enough to know like, sucks. okay, I can't just like drop it all of a sudden. <laughs> and okay. apparently after that episode, after he... He uh, got went back to normal. He was a perfectly fine, upstanding young gentleman. No further problems. <laughs> Apparently, there was an E True Hollywood story. And this is getting back to the movie, so we're fast forwarding a few, quite a few years. But there's an E True Hollywood story about the Exorcist that. Um, a lot of this curse can be traced back to, I think, that kind of renewed interest in the movie. What year was that? Um, shit. I, it, surprisingly late we're talking like 2000s oh wow but that makes sense because you kind of have like i think they re-released it in theaters right around that time because i remember i think it was the anniversary because i remember when probably would have been 30 year then maybe yes because i remember when that was re yes yep 2004 i think is when the special came out so i think i think it was just a combination of like the anniversary of this movie it being re-released so people are experiencing it again Mm -hmm. and yeah that's like another generation because i remember when that was re-released in in theaters and oh yeah i don't remember i do i just remember it being in the Mm. the zeitgeist i guess but uh that, yeah, you have people talking about it again, and then you have this e Hollywood story where they're like, fuck, we gotta make this thing two hours long, let's pad it, and put in a bunch of shit about how, okay, the movie's weird and cursed and stuff, and I think that's what really kind of put that in our, our cultural consciousness. Okay. So, there, okay, so stuff related to filming. Yeah, hit us with the curse stuff. Here we go, this is why, this is why it's cursed. Okay. Definitely cursed. Cursed. 
Ellen Burstyn, who plays Reagan's mother, was really mm-hmm. badly injured during filming. This this happened. This is real. Uh, in, in the scene where possessed Reagan throws her to the ground, there is a wire pulley. And if you look in the, I, I think I saw a GIF that highlighted the part of the screen where you can see it. You can see there's a little, like, kind of bump in the curtains by the window where you can see there would be a wire being pulled so okay. she gets yanked down to the ground and it, it fucked up her back um this is a quote from her she said billy um so william freakin is the director she said billy is one of those directors that's so dedicated to getting the shot right that i think some other considerations sort of fall by the wayside sometimes he's a brilliant director and i don't want to knock him however i did injure my lower back and I had to work with it ever since but it's okay yeah unquote yeah, I've uh, I reviewed The Exorcist for a Patreon review a few months ago. Oh, that's right. Yeah, and so I did some very light research, uh, just have an informed review. Yeah. But I do remember reading multiple accounts of this director uh, really putting his cast and crew oh, yeah. at risk. Oh yeah, he and... he really ran them through the ringer for this movie, including and this isn't in my notes because it doesn't have anything to do with the curse, but he kept the set extremely, extremely cold. cold. Yeah, and that one I get because you know you want I to think breath that's and shit. That's cool, pretty actually. cool. <laughs> but as far as like fucking up people's backs, dude, I don't care how good your movie is. It's, like, not, it's worth not worth that, it, man. Because that's it's something you live with forever. It's like when I made a comment about uh, uh, Hitchcock and the birds, and people were like, "Well, yeah, but it was worth it to get the movie." No, man, no, you don't. You can't it. torture your fucking actors just mm-hmm. because you think it's worth it for you as a creator. Right. Because then, how many other people are going to be like, "Well, he did it, so that's what I have to do." Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's bullshit. Again, let me just say, um. Human centipede, very, <laughs> very safe, healthy conditions for all the actors involved, for all the flack that movie gets. I'm just saying. Yep. We can make a horror movie and treat our actors with respect. Linda Blair was also injured during the bed possession scenes, and she, I guess she fractured her back. It was a slight fracture, but it did affect her throughout her life. Mm-hmm. When I actually, when I Googled um, her injury, there was this scoliosis website that came up, and she was like a feature. I think she does work for scoliosis and like raising awareness and stuff because she had like a section on this site that was about how like this fracture plus another one she got in a movie which like exacerbated the problem she then like developed scoliosis and it's like yeah it it, it, she's had to live with this her whole life um and was that from the harness yes the where she's back and forth yeah Yeah. those scenes where she's sitting up and down in bed and it's a great effect it's fucking terrifying but like again find a safe way to do it right yeah and that is a thing where we knock cgi a lot but cgi is i think i think and a little bit off topic but i think one of the best uses we've come up with for cgi is animals in film oh yeah i think that's such a great development because i mean you don't have to torture animals to sure you know get little cute animal stuff in movies (laughs) (laughs) uh linda blair also received a ton of death threats after this movie's release because people are stupid wait why though because she's she's possessed yeah because people are stupid but also okay her her and ellen burston's back getting hurt how's that fucking curse i know exactly james you don't have to you don't have to tell me because i agree with you none of this is this is just bad filming conditions. Yeah. If that's the case, most movies are yeah. cursed. Oh, all Especially of Kubrick's movies are yeah. fucking cursed. I mean, The Shining is one that people say is cursed. Oh, yeah. I didn't even include it because it's it's like less. There's there's less proof than even these It's more three. of just the director It's more of just, no, it's just Stanley Kubrick is an asshole. <laughs> And, and what Stephen King didn't like it. That's part what that's the curse. Yeah, that's the part of the oh, curse. Oh, spooky. <laughs> I know. James, I know. I hate this episode. <laughs> You're really selling it oh, for I our advertisers <laughs> who are running ads on this. Apparently, the set of the McNeil home burnt down and that delayed filming for six weeks, but allegedly, Reagan's bedroom was unharmed by the fire. I don't know if that's the true. devil wanted it. The but devil... He didn't want the omen to come out, but he protected Reagan's bedroom set. Yeah. So this one could come apparently out. It, the it or William Friedkin says anyway it was because a pigeon got into a circuit box. 
And then a Jesuit priest who I think was also a consultant on the film. He they had, had the small part in it. That's right. Yeah. I yeah. think they asked him to bless the set. Jesuits are fucking cool. Though. They are cool. Jesuits they like cool. fucking They're do a smart. lot of community service dude. and shit. Yeah. You know, as They're much. like the PhDs. Dude, as much as like, you know, I'm not a huge fan of organized religion. <laughs> Jesuits are really Jesuits cool. Are I would hang dope, out with man. the Jesuits, man. Yeah. <laughs> Jack McGrowan, who plays Burke Dennings, who's the director of that film that uh Valen Burston yeah is in which I always forget is the thing in that movie until I rewatch it that we have this weird actor yeah some plot I think he <laughs> dies off screen yeah because she has her director babysit her kid yeah and then she comes home and he's like dead I guess Velasiki Maliaros Father Karras's mother also died when the film was in post-production Another thing in that movie I forgot was a thing. Oh, oh yeah, his mom his is mom. like a thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, There's sure. a lot going on in that movie. There is a lot. Yeah, Jason. Okay, this is <laughs> this is another thing where I <laughs> I just like had to step away for a few minutes because this pissed me off so much. This is this is like shoddy reporting at its worst. Jason Miller's son. Who's that? Father uh, Father Karras. Oh, okay. Jason Miller's son apparently was nearly killed by a motorcycle that hit him during filming. This is true. Okay. But a ton of websites, like more than there should be, (laughs) which is any, (laughs) reported that his son was killed. His son's name is Jordan, and Jordan Miller grew up to become a social worker and I think currently lives in New York. (laughs) That person is alive. And yet, just because we want to have these stupid Halloween time, Halloween season listicles about cursed movies, (laughs) we're all just going to pretend that this dude's kid is dead when that guy, that kid is now an adult doing social work. Other deaths linked to this movie. Linda Blair's grandfather, Max von Sydow's brother, who died on the first day Max was shooting. That sucks. Um, some others, which I couldn't source at all. So if you have sourcing on these, please tell me. So these might not be true? These might not be true at all. A cameraman's a newborn baby, which is fucking awful. A night watchman and unnamed special effects artist. Could not find any sourcing on these. The special effects artist rumor I thought was kind of funny because the makeup artist on that film was Dick Smith, the legendary Dick Smith. He died at 92 years old. You yeah. might know him for the aging makeup on Marlon Brando and The Godfather. He also yeah. did F. Murray Abraham and Amadeus, yeah. uh, Salieri. And he also did Scanners, dude. This man is responsible for the infamous head explosion. Oh, and that gift, yeah. And his protege uh, was Rick Baker. Rick Baker uh, studied under Dick Smith. But I just think that that's funny that we are like, oh, a special effects guy died during this movie. When I look and I'm like, if they're talking about Dick Smith, that dude lived to be so old. <laughs> Televangelist Billy Graham denounced The Exorcist as being literally cursed. And this is the best shit. He thought the actual film, like... If you had a copy of it. Whoa! Oh, curse! <laughs> There's a curse! Burr, 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 burr. Oh my god, it's Billy Graham being like, how dare you <laughs> mock wow. me? If we had Exorcist stuff on the set, that would have been creepier. That would have been cool. I don't instead, think... it, instead, it was my reanimator syringe and my wrestling To be fair, figure. I hate to like... And this is, I'm going to like myth bust this for you. I accidentally knocked some of that stuff down earlier today because I was trying to, I forget what I was putting up there, like rearranging, but I knocked some of that stuff over. And so you're, so I put it back and it's just falling because I didn't put it back very good. Oh, yeah. See, that's the kind of shit. Had you not said anything, had you been a less honest person, we could have had a whole conspiracy about this episode. Right. And how it's cursed. Yeah. (laughs) Like, imagine if, like, not you, but that must have just happened. I've been keeping an eye on it. Really? Yeah. Whoa, it's cursed. (laughs) (laughs) Also, because Chelsea's camera just went out. Yeah, my camera died curse that was fun though that was a lot of fun that was great it actually like spooked me when it did it startled me a little bit (laughs) um oh yeah okay so that was fun so we're gonna move on to like some really depressing (laughs) cool just like more depressing real life stuff actress mercedes mccambridge who voiced pazuzu who is i don't think gets enough credit for Mm -hmm. that incredible incredible performance she, besides having an ongoing personal struggle with alcohol, she lost her son after, so her her son, John, worked at an investment firm and apparently was fired 
After committing financial fraud, he then killed his family and himself in 1987. And he left a letter that was not kind to Mercedes, kind of blaming her for stuff. So Mm. that's real nice. During the film's premiere in Rome, a crucifix on a nearby church was struck by lightning. That I could believe. But then I saw it reported on many sites that the cross fell off the church and into the square below. You'd think that there'd be pictures of this. Because it's spooky and it's this crazy thing that happened. And you think there'd be pictures just because it presumably caused some damage. Nothing. Just people saying that this happened because fuck it. I don't think that that happened. <laughs> the, this, is, this for me, this next thing is actually something about The Exorcist I find very creepy. Oh, yeah. Paul Bateson, who was an x-ray technician, he plays a technician in the scene in the hospital, which is another. That's a scene a lot of people think is the most gruesome scene in The Exorcist is when she's getting. I forget, it's, a, it's the cerebral angiography. And geography, yeah, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Basically, it's a scene where Reagan, and this is like near the beginning of the movie, they basically just, they stick a giant needle in her giant neck. It's needle, gross. Yeah. I remember last time I watched this, I like not. Ooh, the medical the, tests in the movie. Are, medical yeah. gore. Like we've said that before, medical gore is for some reason worse. Paul Bateson, who performed, he, he's like talking to her and he, he, weirdly he was commended in this movie for like really good bedside manner and stuff because he's kind of comforting Reagan this whole time. But he was also a murderer. Like in real life. In real life, he was a murderer. Um, in 1979, he was found guilty of the murder of film critic Addison Verrill, and it's thought he is responsible for a number of other unsolved murders of gay men in New York, but he was never charged. Um, and I think his, that whole like unsolved string of murders plus his case um, has been the focus of a lot of um, like cultural criticism and studies of how like the police don't take murders of, of minorities as like seriously. And, and this prompts William Friedkin, again, the director of The Exorcist, because of this weird experience where like he knew this guy and worked with him and then found out he was maybe a serial killer. He then decides to adapt Gerald Walker's novel Cruising about a serial killer stalking the gay community of Greenwich Village. And this movie, he did alter it a bunch, I think, to more reflect like his own kind of experience with this actor. And this movie is is heavily protested when it comes out. And we'll probably talk more about Cruising and Paul Bateson when we do a queer representation episode. Because I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's technically horror mm-hmm. cruising. I think it's more of like a thriller, but I think it's worth talking about in the same way that Dress to Kill yeah, is. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Worth talking about. It's it's you know horror adjacent. And sure. I guess just a couple other movies that I think people would be upset if I didn't mention because mm-hmm. they're so often like cited in lists of, of cursed movies is The Crow in 1994 because of the onset death of Brandon Lee. And generally there's kind of a, a curse, like an aura of a curse surrounding the Lee family because his father, Bruce Lee, died at such a young age as well. Apparently because of adverse reactions to an ingredient in a painkiller. I didn't Ooh. know that's how he died. Um, but yeah, Brandon was killed on The Crow when they were filming with a prop gun that they like the prop team instead of buying commercial um like like prop bullets they created their own dummy cartridges don't do that <laughs> they were like we'll just make our own but they did it wrong and the gun went off and actually shot and killed them mm. yeah so don't do that yeah. uh Rosemary's Baby also is cited as being cursed, and I think that's mostly because of all the shit that surrounded Roman Polanski and his life um, after this film. Uh, if you're not familiar, <laughs> I, there's about to be a whole movie about it coming out, the Quentin Tarantino one. Oh, yeah. With uh, Margot Robbie playing Sharon Tate. But uh, oh, yeah. so, so Roman Polanski bought a house for music producer Terry Melker, who refused to record music previously for Charles Manson. Yeah, and Charlie Manson wanted to be a musician. He right? did. He has an album. Isn't it kind of shitty? It's a little shitty, but I think just the fact that it's Charlie Manson adds like a whole, some creepy vibes. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like a fun, weird listen if you're in the mood for it, I guess. Sure. Um, Sharon Tate, who was pregnant, was killed along with her unborn baby and four others. And then later, Polanski would be charged with drugging and raping a 13-year-old girl. He is now a fugitive of the U.S. and lives in Europe where people still make movies with him. It's weird. Yep, and we still give him Oscars. Yeah, although was, now he's not a member of the um, Academy. It was like in the 2000s it was that he recent. got a fucking Oscar. It was very recent. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, other oh. things from Rosemary's Baby. I love that. This is the one other thing. Uh, okay, so look, we got the composer who dies a year after the movie comes out, but also producer William Castle. Yes, that William Castle. Oh, uh, go to our movie gimmicks episode if you want to learn more about him. He's the <laughs> fucking best. He got a bad case of kidney stones, and I wrote that Satan is losing his touch here because I love that. I, I I think that's the thing that's so funny to me is it's always these movies about Satan where like we get these curses, and I love that Satan is either so powerful that he like kills a little kid actor or he just gives someone kidney stones hey, like kidney stones are apparently real painful. I, yes so i've heard but like what is what is the extent <laughs> of his powers or, or like how much does he care and why yeah <laughs> like come on but yeah so so people argue and speaking of that trend of it being movies about satan people argue that uh because we're, we're superstitious and we think these curses exist because we're meddling with the devil or the supernatural or we're messing with forces that we're not meant to be messing with. But here's a list of other movies or TV shows that are allegedly cursed. Bewitched, the TV show is allegedly cursed. witches. Cursed. Sure, witches, all right. Our gang, more famously known as the Little Rascals. Gangs, you don't, you know. Sure, the Superman film franchise, cursed. He's an alien with superpowers. The Wizard of Oz. Wizardry, that's demon work. The Passion of the Christ. The Matrix <laughs> series, the Dark Knight trilogy. What Dark Knight trilogy? Because of Heath Ledger and the fact that the shooting and stuff happened, and that because remember the Aurora, yeah, the Aurora, shooting, of course, but, yeah. You know, curse. But I, I, I also I think just to kind of wrap this up, the I used Snopes for a lot of this because Snopes is the fucking best. I also accidentally typed the experts at Snope, <laughs> which I enjoy. <laughs> They, I, I wrote down one of their explanations for these lists, and I think they, they summarize it so well. I'm just going to read their description. So, in general, most cursed lists, which supposedly document remarkably high levels of premature deaths and other tragedies of life within a group of people connected by some common bond, should be taken as nothing more than frivolous entertainment because they are constructed through a number of misleading means. One, they list only entries that fit the assumed pattern, omitting any mention of the usually much larger group of entries that don't fit the pattern. Two, they include inaccurate or distorted information in order to bolster the length of entries that don't appro appropriately belong there, hence why researching this sucked so much ass. <laughs> Three, they make the ordinary and commonplace seem unusual through the use of selective inclusion. People get sick, die in accidents, and kill each other or themselves all the time. These are the facts of life as sad as they are. Such deaths may be tragedies, but they're hardly outside the pale of ordinary human experience. And I think that that's an important thing to take away from this episode. It's an important thing to just remember always. Like, just, yeah, omitting things that don't fit a pattern just right. to, like, fit your preconceived idea. Right. Just I always keep that. I think everyone should have to take psych classes because oh, yeah. you learn oh, about yeah. this shit in psych classes. And I just catch like, myself being response you know like oh I, yeah everyone it's human nature everyone to do does that it. we yeah, look they, for patterns and we want to, to yeah and you just like leave out the shit that doesn't adhere to that which you want to believe yeah and but it's not even like malicious it's just no you. no it's yeah, subconscious right. most of the time the trick is like knowing it and being honest with yourself right. enough to like and so right yeah so to end this episode yeah i i told james i can prove any movie is cursed yeah and I asked by, you to, by following these by things, following yeah. this yeah by by following the the rules that people who decide things like the omen and the and poltergeist are are cursed so I I told James pick a, like any movie mm -hmm. what'd you pick I picked friend of the pod the brave little <laughs> toaster friend of the pod brave little toaster okay so I said, all right, I'm going to prove to you that Brave Little Toaster is cursed. Which has, it's cursed with bomb-ass music. That, yes. Tell you that. But also, like, fucking depressing shit, James. What? Jesus. <laughs> Thomas M. Dish, the author of the 1980 novel The Brave Little Toaster, shot and killed himself in 2005 following the death of his longtime partner, Charles Naylor. Um, also, I went and, like, just read his Wikipedia about him, and he sounds like he was wonderful, and I got really sad, and I wanted, I was like, I kind of, now I, like, want to revisit the movie, because he sounds like he, I don't know, just learning about him, I was like, he's a mind that I'm sad we don't have, Aww. and, yeah, he seemed like a very sensitive soul, and mm. it made me sad. 
Screenwriter Joe Ramped was killed in a car accident after an SUV. He was a passenger of lost control and swerved through a guardrail and fell into the Navarro River in Mendocino County, California. He co-directed Cars and also co-wrote Toy Story along with a ton of other stuff. And he he was like one of the big animation dudes at oh, the wow. time. Yeah, I think he died in like 2009. But he did a lot of voice stuff too, and he voiced Heimlich, who's like my favorite. I love the Bugs Heimlich. Life. Yeah, the, the caterpillar. caterpillar. Oh. He's, if I think if I had to pick a favorite Pixar character, it'd be Heimlich. I love him. The, I love when he the gets his little from butterfly a, wings. The caterpillar from A Bug's Life wrote Brave Little Toaster. Yeah, he, yeah, he was one of the screenwriters. Wow. Mm-hmm. Phil Hartman, um, who <sighs> voiced Air Conditioner, murdered oh, by his man. wife in 1998. Uh, that's something I still get sad about every that's once in a while. the fucking worst. Dude. Yeah. John Lovitz, who voices radio, was extremely close to Phil Hartman, and he's had an ongoing emotional feud with Andy Dick over Lovitz's belief that, and a lot of people in Hollywood believe this too, that Andy Dick was the reason that Phil's wife fell off the wagon and got back on drugs because she was a recovering addict and- a lot of Ooh. people think Andy Dick got her back on drugs. Ooh. And so people blame it. It's really messy and sad. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And so this this conflict between John and Andy has it's culminated in like physical confrontations, including one in 2007 where John Lovett smashed Andy Dick's head into a bar. Jeez. Jonathan Benair, uh, this is when I'm this, in true curse fashion of getting into like dumb, tenuous shit um, stuff where it's like this is happening years later. Uh, Jonathan Benair, voice of black and white TV. I, this is a young death, though. He died at age 47 of a cerebral hemorrhage and heart attack. Judy Toll as Mishmash, that like Joan Rivers thing. Oh, uh, yeah. She died at age 44 of melanoma. And here's where we're getting real. <laughs> Thorough Ravenscroft voiced Kirby. He's I think, is the vacuum cleaner. And he, oh, you, yeah, you yeah. know him. He sings You're a Mean One, Mr. Grinch. And he voice, he does all the, the voices. The vacuum cleaner sang You're a Mean One, yeah. Mr. Grinch. And he does, I can hear it right now. Yeah, he does like all the voices in the Haunted Mansion and shit the like oh the, fuck. yeah like the song and the ha- lots of disneyland stuff he had, this is the the curse of ah oh, just the curse of the brave little toaster really got him he had a lifelong dream of recording the entire bible on tape but james earl jones beat him to it you're saying there's an audio tape of the bible read by james apparently earl jones? yeah ravenscroft died at, at 91 years old by the way curse but yeah that curse got him james earl jones beat him out to the bible on tape <laughs> Uh, and the last, truly the worst instance of the Brave Little Toaster curse. Randy Bennett voiced computer, and when you click on Randy Bennett's Wikipedia, it links to Randy Bennett, the American college <laughs> basketball coach, currently head coach at St. Mary's. How do you know they're not the same guy? I checked they're not. Oh. So, curse. Curse! Got him. The curse of, uh, of falling into obscurity by having your Wikipedia article hijacked by someone else. Dude, I mean, if you have the same name as someone who's involved in sports in any way. That person's showing up before you on Google or anything. It yeah. doesn't matter what you do. Sports is just so big. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's uh, that's our episode about curses. Fun. <laughs> Lots of fun. I had fun recording it. I did not have fun <laughs> researching it. I'm glad that we can put it behind us and that you don't have to worry about uh, researching all these deaths. God, it's depressing. And accidents. You were in a bad place. I was, and weeks. even just trying to like do the brave little toaster one, it really was a weird feeling. Clicking through the Wikipedia and being like, "All right, I hope someone something shitty happened to this person, so it fits my little thing I'm doing at the end of this podcast." I'm glad I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> like that was a bad like headspace to be in, you know? Yeah, you weren't happy. No, but it's over now, and hopefully. Uh... I don't know, someone like this. But yeah, it's just, again, there's not a brave little toaster curse. It's not, there's not, you know, it's just shit happens and it's sad. Shit happens, man. Yeah. It happens. But then you, and also just to end it on a lighter note, you look at some, like, you have someone like Thrower Ravenscroft. He died at 90 something. You have equally as many people who had perfectly fine, normal lives who are involved with these movies. It's just, you know, it's life. Yeah. Life is random, dude. Yeah. Next week, do you want to talk about that? Sure. Next week, we're talking about Overlord. Yeah, we're going to review Overlord, which I'm excited about. Yeah. Because we that's... watched that last night, and I really enjoyed it. Yeah, that is a... Uh, uh, yeah, check it out if you haven't. It is... It's a World War II horror, yeah. I put loosely. Yeah. 
it, it becomes horror. But yeah, I mean, when we heard that description, we both thought campy because it's about Nazis. I it's thought like, it was going to be something very different like than Dead what it was. Snow or whatever that movie is. Like, I haven't seen that. It might not even get the title right, but I just assume those are campy. There's a movie about Nazis on the dark side of the moon. I just... Oh, it, that's right. Yeah. You know, those those Nazi horror movies, to me, I just presume are, are all camp, campy. Yeah. But this is not. It's a very well-made it's movie. It's really good, yeah. Some very good use of CGI. Yeah, I was, I was surprised at how much I, I didn't mind CGI in that yeah. one. Yeah, it and it's got a ton of Game of Thrones actors it. In does. It does, even random Game of Thrones actors like guy who played a guard at Winterfell. <laughs> I loved it. All right. Yeah, so that's yeah. what next week is. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the meantime, hit us. Uh, oh, yeah, and RTX. Oh, yeah, come see us at RTX. Mm-hmm. That's July That's our live 7th. show. Live show. Sunday, July 7th. Get tickets yeah, at RTX. Yeah, play games with us. Yes, the splice is right. The splice and is we're right. And we giving away <laughs> props that we don't need anymore. Yep. So come to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the meantime, you can follow Dead Meat on social media at Dead Meat James on Twitter and Instagram. And I'm Carebeck, C-R-E-B-E-C-C on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want merch, deadmeatstore.com. Mm-hmm. And feel free to email deadmeatpod at gmail.com with any feedback or suggestions or what have you. And yeah, we'll be talking about Overlord next week. But until then, I'm James. I'm Chelsea. And this has been the Dead Meat Podcast. <laughs>